Hello everyone, welcome. I am Monica Yellowtail. I'll be hosting today's webinar. Before we begin, for those who may not know, Redwin is a nonprofit organization that provides tribal technical assistance on a variety of programs, including but not limited to HHS, CY, and elder abuse. This ranges from poly review to emails to site visits. If you're interested, you can contact me at my email, monica at redwind.net. You can also visit our website at redwind-net for additional information on services we provide, upcoming events and resources, such as handouts and guidebooks that you can download. This presentation was brought to you in partnership with Redwind Consulting. This project is supported by grant number 15JOVW21GK02197STOP, awarded by Awarded by the Office on Violence Against Women, U.S. Department of Justice, the opinions, findings, conclusions, and recommendations expressed in this publication are of those of authors and do not necessarily reflect the views of the U.S. Department of Justice. As it states, this training is part of our Tribal Governments Project. Presenting with us today, we have Raquel de Herrera. If you have any questions or comments, you can put them in the chat box or raise your hands and we'll get to your questions and your, we'll get those answers. If you have any technical issues, do send me a private message and we'll try to get it resolved. I'm going to now turn it over to our presenter, Raquel. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Monica, for that introduction. Um, I just want to introduce myself. Um, I am uh, a Taos Pueblo descendant, uh, Indigenous Mexican. Um, person and I've been with Redwind for almost nine years now. Uh, I started as a special projects coordinator uh, under Redwind, so I'd help with their special projects. That included um, working with um, a tribe on with their, um, their homeless team. Uh, I also worked as an advocate for the Hasea Advocate Program, which is a local community-based uh, native advocacy program. Uh, and then I became the program director for that. And I am now a tribal college campus technical assistance um, project coordinator um, through Red Wind. So we have three projects under the Office of Violence Against Women. One of them is for tribal college campuses where I work on um, sexual assault responses for campuses. And then we have this project, which is where, um, where we focus more on responses for urban native um, people and programs. And then we have our tribal government uh, grantees who are grantees, um, tribal grantees through the Office of Violence Against Women. And so I just wanted to introduce myself there. Um, today, we're going to be talking about responses to um, urban Native uh, victims and survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, stalking, dating violence. Um, I do want to start with the self-care um, that, you, you know, the content that we'll be talking about could be activating, um, could be, uh, I'm sorry, can we, can you hear me okay? I keep getting some feedback. I just want to make sure you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you okay, Rika. Okay, just making sure there was just little glitches here. Um, so I want to start with this disclaimer that there's um, content that we will be sharing that could be activating. And so please, if you need to, um, please feel free to take a step, you know, back if you need to take a break, if you need to walk away, um, whatever that looks like for you, um, please feel free to do whatever you need to take care of yourself. I am also available after um, the presentation. If you would like to talk about anything or if anything comes up, um, I'm here for you. Um, I will share my email at the end of the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So we start this quote, um, envisioning a world without violence. So Red Wind, that's really kind of our, um, you know, that this is what guides our work. We are envisioning a world without violence and not just violence in our indigenous communities, but you know, the whole you know, wide world. And we believe that our indigenous um, values and traditions can really help with um, that, with um, ending violence. So this quote is, uh, I don't know who um, said it, but um, 
it's something that we have a, in a, a lot of our um, content. Uh, we are the epitome of our ancestors. They are always right here. I sit at the table with them regularly. They are right here watching me, guiding me, reminding me that I am a woman of my people. And so it's really important as we start this work um, that, uh, especially working with Native victims and survivors, that our ancestors um, really guide us. There's a strong connection um, for us and our and our ancestors. And we'll kind of talk through this, how this can look, um, how this looks like, um, or the importance of this. But I really, we want to start this foundation of, um, it is through our ancestors, it is through our traditional knowledge, it is through our indigenous knowledge um, that we can end violence um, in our world. I do want to say that anytime you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, this is really an open um, webinar where um, interaction can happen. If you have questions, uh, feel free to not say them at the end and just put them in the chat. I'll keep an eye, um, an eye out on the, on the chat. Um, those questions, that way I can answer them. I know sometimes when I'm in a webinar or what, you know, um, participating in one and I have a question and I wait till the very end, um, I end up forgetting what I wanted to ask. So please feel free um, to, um, to ask your questions in the chat and definitely feel free. I see some have, um, have said hello and um, stated where they where they're at, what they do. Um, and so please feel free to do that as well. I would love to see who's here um, joining us and um, what you all do for work and um, what brought you here today. So please feel free to, to do that or raise your hand or um, anything that you need to do um, in this. It's pretty open, flexible, um, so please feel free to do that. Uh, next slide, please. So when we start these um, presentations, we always um, start off with some statistics. And I think these are important, but they always have a caveat of, um, you know, uh, while in general, this is what it looks like, it can be um, very different in um, different um, tribal lands, um, experiences, things like that. So this is an important number, uh, a percentage that nearly 78% of American Indian Alaska Native people live off reservations. Um, and, and we'll kind of get into the history of um, how we saw this happen, um, why there's such a big number, um, but really 78%, and that's a, that's a huge number. Nearly eight out of 10 American Indian Alaska Native people live in or near cities. Um, more than four in five Alaska Native American Indian women, so that's about 84.3% have experienced violence in their lifetime. Um, that is an astronomical number. Um, we know that um, it could be higher in some instances, um, but this is from the Violence Against American Indian Alaska Native Women and Men, NIG report, the National Institute of Justice report that came out. Um, <clears throat> it's based on the 2014 uh, uh, survey, and this came out in 2016. Um, so please, this is a great resource for you all to have. You can find it on the DOJ website. Um, you can email me if you can't find it and I can send that to you. Um, there's a pretty good report um, kind of talking about um, this, uh, these statistics in more depth. Um, this report also found that more than half of American Indian and Alaska Native women, so about 56.1% have experienced sexual violence in their lifetime. And then more than half of Alaska Native and American Indian uh, women, 55.5% have experienced physical violence by intimate partners in their lifetime. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. So almost half of American Indian Alaska Native women, 48.8% have been stalked in their lifetime. 
the vast majority, so about 96% of American Indian and Alaska Native female victims of sexual violence experience the violence at the hands of a non-Native perpetrator. So this is um, this is an important to note that when we often look at intimate partner violence um, or sexual violence in this instance, it's often we see where if the perpetrator is white, then the victim or survivor is white. If the victim is black, um, then the perpetrator is black. Um, we often see that that's the, the majority of those cases, not to say that that's all, but the majority. Whereas for our native um, community and um, native people, it's the opposite, where um, it's usually um, the opposite. So victims of sexual violence experience violence at the hands of a non-native perpetrator. So, so that's an important thing to note. Um, and we'll kind of talk about why that is, um, but just something to think about. Um, Native women also face murder rates more than 10 times the national average in some counties. And to even go further into this, uh, where a lot of the time, for even for sexual violence, um, the there's more likelihood of weapons being involved. So um, gun use um, and... Um, other things that are used as weapons in sexual violence um, perpetrated against Native women. And then American Indian Alaska Native victims of violence are less likely to receive the needed services. And um, this is due to a number of things that we'll kind of talk about as we move forward. Um, but it's really important to understand that um, it's already difficult for victims and survivors um, to come forward and access services or um, to seek out services. And it's even more, um, you know, there are more barriers and there are more um, unique challenges that Native victims and survivors have uh, when accessing or, um, or receiving services. Another thing that's not in here for our statistics, I want to note that in this NIJ report, they also um, included men in this survey. And um, while I don't have the exact numbers, uh, our native men experienced um, violence at um, a very high rate compared to um, non-native counterparts. So this is something to think about as well, um, where, Native men are experiencing violence at higher rates. And unfortunately, this didn't um, include two-spirit folks. And two-spirit folks are, um, are, are Native people who um, can be gender non-conforming, um, can identify as both man and woman. Um, it, it depends on um, their tribe and how their tribe identifies it and how they identify themselves. And then also lesbian, um, gay, LGBTQ um, was not included in this, but we do know um, that they, that our LGBTQ and two-spirit relatives um, experience violence um, in, in higher rates. Um, so that's just something else to note that I wanted to put on here um, or wanted to express. I'm just going to look at the chat here. Thank you. It's good to see everybody here. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so in this, um, before we start this, there's just some basic terms that we like to um, define and kind of let you know how we view these things. Um, just because sometimes a lot of these words um, get used and we kind of just, you know, because they're just used often, we kind of forget what they mean, or maybe um, we don't necessarily understand exactly what they mean. So we wanted to just kind of start this out with some basic terms. Um, so starting with colonization. So colonization in like a general form is the policy or practice of acquiring um, full or partial um, political control over um, another country um, or occupying it with settlers um, and then exploiting it economically. So um, kind of the colonization period is 
um, that first point of contact. So we talk about 1492 um, when, you know, Columbus came over and <clears throat> um, came over and then, you know, just decided um, that, you know, all the resources belong to them. A lot of the practices and Paul, you know, that they had um, were, were very um, oppressive and really with the intent of economically um, uh, exploiting um, the, the new world as they call it. Um, and something that's not on here that I think is important is um, right now, so, we see that period in 1492 um, through the 1700s where this there's this mass colonization happening um, on, you know, in North and South America. And so right now, thinking about as the United States of America was formed, we start um, getting into settler colonialism. And this is different from colonization in the, in, in the way that um, it is a system of oppression based on genocide and colonialism, but it aims to displace a population of a nation. So, uh, and replacing it with new um, settler, a new settler po population. So this looks like removing native people completely from, um, you know, settler um, spaces, um, removing them, putting, you know, locating them in um, places that, um, are far away uh, from their homeland and uh, and and also uh, really thinking about um, you know using instead of kind of exploiting exploiting economically it's more of removing all indigenous people so that it can make way for um, livestock lands you know um, ways to um, farm the land um, and, and really have ownership of that land. Um, it's distinct from other forms of colonialism because um, the colonizer comes with the intention of making a new home on the land and it such insists on settler sovereignty on all things in their new domain. So when we see in colonization times, um, native um, Native tribes, Native people had sovereignty over um, the way they govern themselves. And then we see through settler colonization, and we'll talk about this um, further as we go on, um, we start seeing that sovereignty um, getting challenged and um, really um, being, you know, not full on um, autonomous and sovereign. The thing to, that's important to note is that there are over 500 federally recognized tribes. So with that federally recogni recognition that comes with sovereignty, that comes with the ability to, um, you know, govern themselves um, and, and have their own autonomy. Um, there's also recognition, state recognition. So they might not be federally recognized, but they're state recognized. Um, and that comes with, um, you know, um, thing, certain things um, um, that doesn't really, uh, you know, not the same as federal, but might come with some um, ability for sovereignty. Um, and then we have uh, really this idea of, um, I kind of lost my frame of, frame of thought there. Um, but, but so as we move forward, we see that there is the sovereignty, but there's not this full sovereignty. Um, there's still ways in which um, the settler uh, state um, imposes, um, you know, rules and laws that kind of uh, limit the sovereignty of tribal nations. And we saw this, you know, in the 17, 1800s, where um, if um, Native people did not um, put a fence um, in, in their property, then they would lose that because they would lose that property because it was not, um, they were not adhering to state laws and adhering to um, 
you know, the rules of the settler state. And, and that's where we see a lot of land grabs um, and, and things like that. So there's colonization. And right now we're in settler colonialism where um, the settler state imposes um you know, rules and guidelines that are to be followed. But at the same time, tribes have complete sovereignty and will always, um, you know, will always have that, um, that ability. And so a lot of the time when responding to violence and what we see happening when VAWA is, um, you know, reauthorized, there's that push for um, recognizing tribal sovereignty. Uh, and that's important. Um, so then going to culturally appropriate. So I, so I did not create this PowerPoint. Um, but um, so I think it's culturally appropriate. But I also wanted to touch on culturally appropriate cultural appropriation. Um, and so I wanted to talk about cultural appropriate, you know, is having, um, you know, culturally competent um, care. So it respects diversity um, in, you know, recognizes cultural factors that affect um, victims and survivors. So um, whether that's language, communication styles, beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors, um, that there's this basic understanding and then an appropriate response to that. So if you're responding to violence, um, if you're responding to um, violence and you, you want to make sure that you are culturally aware and, you know, um, appropriate, a good example would be, um, so, uh, those who are Dine, um, Dine, a Navajo people, they, um, there's, you know, a lot of, um, of those who believe that, uh, you know, anything that comes from the body could be used as bad medicine. So if you go with them, go with someone who is Navajo and, um, they need to do a sexual assault, a forensic exam and, um, there needs to be, you know, they want to collect hair. Um, and if there's, you know, the, the victim or survivor is, you know, not agreeing to that and, um, and is, you know, adamant that that not happen, you know, instead of imposing um, your belief systems and imposing what you believe um, that you you understand and you advocate for that, knowing that for this person um, there there is a concern of this being used um, as bad medicine against them. So really having that cultural appropriate response, being aware, understanding, uh, and and being. Um, just sensitive in that in that regard. Uh, cultural appropriation um, is, you know, the inappropriate or unacknowledged adoption of um, an element or elements of one culture identity by members of another culture identity, and it even it, it becomes especially um, especially controversial, um, especially. Um, it just exacerbated when it is a dominant culture or the main um, stream. And in this case, uh, you know, the settler culture that is using um, marginalized um, cultures, <clears throat> um, you know, using things. So an example we see a lot is using sage. So a lot of um, sage, I, I know, for, I think it was like in 2020, you could buy sage off of Etsy or anywhere at the grocery store, or um, I even saw it at a gas station um, that was just, you know, used for mass um, use. And, you know, that that is cultural appropriation um, in that um, for Native folks, um, sage has different meanings for them. Why they smudge can be different. Um, and really there were, there's rules and guidelines, um, to that. So, um, buying sage, um, isn't appropriate. Selling sage isn't appropriate. Um, that there's, you know, certain, um, 
rituals that have to happen when gathering sage. And um, so a lot of this cultural appropriation um, is important to kind of understand. And I mentioned this because, you know, as you have a program and maybe you're not, not <clears throat> native specific, but you would like to offer um, these things to native victims and survivors that come into your program, um, I think it's completely um, appropriate to, um, <clears throat> you know, think about how you can offer these things in a good way. And so one of the, the ways that I think is important is, you know, if you are in an urban area to reach out and look, you know, to the native community to see how you can provide a tradi traditional medicines um, in your program or if it is appropriate or um, how you can do that in a way that is, um, has been, um, you know, has had indigenous input in that. Um, anything that you do, you want to make sure that you're not appropriating, um, but that you are um, really being intentional with how you're using things. Um, so cult cultural competence is, you know, the ability to know that they're and understand that there are different cultures other than your own. So knowing that um, there are different values, beliefs, um, attitudes um, that differ from yours uh, and being able to, cons you know, respond um, appropriately um, to those things. So whether that's through planning, implementing and evalu evaluating your program, um, you know, some things to think about with cultural competency is it's a, it's more introspective. So it's more, you know, diving deep within yourself. And, um, you know, I think a good way to start this, and I tell every um, person um, that really a good way to kind of do this introspective work is to kind of like think about your ancestors and think about where you are from and, you know, start diving into some of those um, traditional values, belief systems, um, your traditional medicine. So we were all indigenous to somewhere. And I think, you know, in the United States of America, there, there is this broad culture of, you know, USA culture. But I also think that, you know, we, that for a lot of those who are non-native, um, you are indigenous to somewhere and there are customs and values and belief systems that came before, I'm going to even say even before um, where we see colonization take heavy hold. Um, and so going back to some of those, um, to those belief systems and those um, more indigenous ways of, of thinking. And I think that's a good way to start um, to think about that so that you know, there's a framework of understanding um, your culture and then understanding other cultures out there. Um, so, and then there's this co-learning piece where, you know, I think it's important to not, you know, one of the things that um, is, is not something that I would recommend is, you know, waiting for a Native victim or survivor to walk in to your office um, to then start learning about Native culture. Um, you want to do this, um, you know, beforehand on your own, um, of course, um, making sure that the resources and um, the sources that you are using are um, legitimate um, there are a lot of great um, Indigenous scholars out there, writers, um, poets out there, um, musicians, artists, those type of things where you can really immerse yourself into learning about Native culture. Um, but you don't want to wait until um, and then expect a Native victim or survivor to kind of educate you on those things. Um, while there is a co-learning, I do believe that through any inter, uh, inner, inner relationship that we have with one another, or any interaction that we have, we learn from one another. So I'm not saying not to, you know, um, 
learn from one another, but really don't expect Native victims and survivors to come and educate you on these things. Um, and so that's important to think about. And then um, another important piece is just knowing that we all don't, we'll, we all won't we all, even myself, you know, um, there, like I said, there are over 500 federally recognized tribes and there are many more that aren't federally recognized, but that are, um, tribal nations in this country, in California alone, there's, uh, you know, so many. And so, you, you know, I also understand that I don't know every, um, native custom, every native belief, um, and, and that comes with just knowing that, that there's a lifelong learning on all of our parts, um, that you're not going to know all the answers, um, but that this is um, a lifelong thing, that journey uh, that you will um, continuously take. And this kind of goes into that cultural humility. So um, really understanding that um, you don't know everything that there is to know about um, what it means to be native or native culture or um, you know native experience, life experiences. Um, you won't know all those answers, and and also the cultural humility piece is to know that you know you the ability to understand and be empathetic and sympathize and critically think about how, you know, all these things intersect, um, with, um, you know, with native people and those who experience violence. Any questions? I'm going to look here. Okay. I don't see any, um, next slide, please. So some more basic terms is cultural relevance. So I will give an example um, we do a 40 hour domestic violence training, um, in Colorado Springs and we had, um, had little goodie bags for the end and they had sage in them. And we had a couple of people who came from Alaska and their tradition, um, they don't smudge. So they had no idea, um, what sage was and what it was used for. Um, and so when we think about cultural relevance, um, it's important to understand that not every tribe, you know, we're not monolithic. We don't all practice the same things, um, believe the same things, that there are some um, universal uh, beliefs and values that we share, um, but there are still um, differences there. And so you want to make sure that what you bring in from a cultural perspective is relevant to those you are serving. Um, and this also is the same, uh, not every native person is a traditional person. So they might not, you know, smudge. Uh, they might um, be Christian. They, they might, um, you know, not experience things um, that you see, um, or that you would um, think of. So just being relevant, um, culturally relevant um, is, is important. Uh, cultural sensitivity, this is the same, you know, just be sensitive to the fact that um, there are different customs than your own and, and not, you know, when I think about sensitivity, I think about, it's kind of um, an odd thing to say, but um, really thinking about dismantling this idea, especially when we think about in the constitution or the declaration of independence, I can't remember which one, but it, you know, um, refers to native indigenous people as savages. And, you know, while we have moved beyond that in some ways, um, there's still, you know, remnants of this, how that, um, expresses itself in our day-to-day -day actions. Even if you're unintentionally doing, you unintentionally do it, um, or, you know, unconsciously, you know, subconsciously think about it. Um, it's really important to think about and to challenge that idea that, um, you know, native culture is less than, um, other cultures and 
your culture, things like that. And so that's where, you know, sensitivity comes into place. Uh, decolonizing trauma. So when we talk about decolonizing trauma, um, we talk about it in a way that um, is not only an individual, um, you know, trauma is not only an individualistic um, experience, nor is it um, healed through an individual um, person that it's in, you know, um, healed through community, it's healed through connection, it's healed through relationship with one another, and not only um, person to person, but um, healing through connection through the land, through, um, you know, the animals um, that are, um, that share this world with us. Um, that it's really uh, a, a community effort in decolonizing trauma. And we'll kind of go into that um, further into this um, webinar. But when we talk about decolonizing trauma, it's more of the um, less pathologize, you know, path um, pathologizing, I don't know if that's the word, um, but more of connection and more um, just being aware of not only um, and I think the, a really good one, good way to explain it is I know it's an Oprah book, um, where instead of saying what's wrong with you, what happened to you, um, in that way. So that kind of just changes the whole shift from, you know, what's wrong to what happened to you. Um, but also understanding, um, the many layers of trauma in our indigenous communities, um, enrollment. So when we talk about enrollment, um, we're talking about um, those who are enrolled in their tribal communities. So um, because tribes are sovereign, um, because they are their own nations, they are, um, they um, decide um, how to, um, they decide how they will um, who belongs in their community, um, and, and also, um, will enroll them. So that comes with sometimes an, um, an enrollment card or identification. Um, sometimes when you have those who, um, are moving to urban areas, their IDs are their enrollment, um, IDs. And then there's some urban native people who are not enrolled. So they are not enrolled into their tribal communities. Um, they are descendants. Um, and, and this is through, you know, um, many things and it depends on the tribe and, um, and how they determine enrollment, um, ability. Um, so when you come across that, you, you might come across urban native people who are not enrolled. Um, and then those who are enrolled. Um, and then ethnicity. So when we talk about ethnicity, race and ethnicity sometimes are conflated with one another. Um, ethnicity is when we talk about the, the community, the practices, the rituals, um, the, the culture piece of a group of people. Um, and so uh, when we think about that ethnicity, that is what we're talking about. Um, next slide. So I'll just kind of move forward. Um, <clears throat> so when working with victims and survivors who are Native, um, one thing to be um, aware of that's important, it's critical to be aware of, is multi-generational trauma. So trauma that isn't just experienced by that one person, but it extends from one generation to the next. Um, it can be silent covert, undefined, surfacing through nuances and inadvertently taught or implied through someone's life from an early age onward. Um, and so this is passed on from one generation to the next, memory that is carried but not understood, um, and it contributes to social problems that exist today. Um, and so when we think about multi-generational trauma, it's the idea that all of the traumatic things that happen from colonization, um, you know, through forced assimilation, um, genocide, um, you know, forced sterilization, those things get stored in DNA that are then passed down to, um, to 
um, children, grandchildren. And so, you know, this is really important because when we think about um, when I was an advocate um, for our urban native program, one thing that was always hard was, you know, maybe we worked with three victims and the other, you know, the non-native program worked with, you know, 20 victims. Um, and while it looks like, you know, there would be less work working with native victims with only three, we are unpacking so many things. So we're not only, you know, addressing and working with um, domestic violence, sexual violence. We are also, you know, working with all of these things that we um, will we'll talk about in the next slide, but all of this history that was passed on. Um, and so that really requires a lot of work. It requires a lot of time. It requires understanding. Um, and it requires the importance of recognizing this multi-generational trauma. I read a really great book and I cannot remember it was in college. Um, and she, you know, the author was, um, talking about decolonizing museums and talked about how important it is for just acknowledgement of these things. Um, so, you know, I think acknowledging to the victim and survivor that not only are they carrying this trauma from, you know, the violence that they have experienced, but they're also carrying trauma from what their ancestors experienced, what their parents experienced, their grandparents. Um, and that can be really, um, you know, I don't want to say validating, but it is, it can be really, you know, a weight lifted of just someone understands all of this that I'm carrying, um, and why it's, you know, um, incredibly hard, um, going through this. Um, and so multi-generational trauma is, um, you know, where this trauma that's carried through generations, um, it's also can be, um, called intergenerational trauma. Intergenerational trauma is just kind of, um, where, um, trauma is carried on from one to the next. Um, and so, this is an important thing when we're thinking about responding to victims and survivors, sexual violence and domestic violence or native. Um, next slide, please. So we, a colleague of mine, Benita Ball and my executive director, Vicki Abanez created this um, graphic here to kind of talk about the historical context of this all. So when we look at the statistics, when we look at, you know, all these, you know, terms that we are defining, such as colonization, cultural competency, um, ethnicity, um, you know, all of these things, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. So the, the rates of violence that we see in our indigenous and native communities and against our native people did not just happen out of nowhere, um, <clears throat> that there are many things in history. And this isn't even just, you know, this is a very, very small, um, you know, chunk of things that, you know, have happened throughout history to, that impacted um, our, our tribal nations and our communities. Um, but we really wanted to show how all of these things kind of lead to contribute and perpetuate what we see in our communities and the violence against native people. Um, so we have the pre-colonization um, time where, you know, our communities were more egalitarian. So, you know, maybe there were, you know, a separation of duties where, you know, um, a group of people um, did this and another group of people did this. When we talk about egalitarian, it means that there was no um, one um, role was not more important than another, or one role didn't carry more power than another, that there was really this idea that, um, you know, we all do well when we all do well. Um, we all um, contribute to our community. Um, everything um, 
you know, there's this, you know, reciprocation and responsibility to one another. Um, emphasize harmony with nature. So, you know, that connection to nature, um, respecting and honoring all our interconnected relationships and living in balance. So really this is, you know, again, I don't want, we're not generalizing because they're, you know, um, not every, um, tribe are the same, not every nation's the same, not every village, not every Pueblo are the same. Um, <clears throat> but when we think about some of those universal themes, this is really, um, what we see, um, pre-colonization. Then in the 1600s, we see through the European contact that led to historic and tragic change in the lives of indigenous people. So we see, um, you know, really impacting family life, community life, um, violence, um, sickness, illness that decimated, uh, I mean, a whole, I mean, whole communities. And, and um, so when we think about this, you know, tragic change, and it's a rapid change, um, you know, with that comes a lot of dysfunction, with that comes a breakdown of resources, a breakdown of supports, a breakdown of um, a lot of things. So um, we see that in the 1600s, but still, we still see tribes were viewed as independent nations. So um, I remember learning about the French and Indian War um, when the um, um, the uh, Revolutionary War was happening. We had George Washington trying to get um, tribal nations to side with them and Great Britain trying to get tribal nations to side with them. They were viewed as independent nations. Um, and then in the 1700s, um, you know, that, and of course, that's the revolutionary um, time was, was in the 1700s, but we see a lot of European exploration widespread. And so you see Spanish exploration, you see Dutch, French, British, um, you know, explore, exploration. Uh, we also see smallpox blankets being distributed. So intentionally infecting blankets with smallpox and handing them out, um, you know, and really trying again, this is with colonization, trying to remove um, and exploit indigenous people. Um, we see that. Um, the first U.S. census was in the 1700s. And this is a part of, you know, um, really, you see this as um, a way to impose um, and challenge um, tribes sovereignty um, through this census. And then in the 1800s, we see the BIA created, which is the Borough of Indian Affairs. And the, and, you know, important thing to know is BIA is through um, the def a, a war um I can't even think of the word, but under the war program. So when we think about how even today the U.S. and indigenous nations um, relate to one another, it's still under a branch of wartime, like war. Um, and so that's just an interesting thing that I had learned a while ago. And, um, and again, this was created um, because we also see um, the crow dog versus spotted, spotted tail, um, major crimes act. And so what this did, um, this was pivotal in, um, kind of challenging and, um, impacting tribal sovereignty. And so crow dog and spotted tail, um, was so crow dog and spotted tail. I can't remember which one, but one, um, native person ended up killing another native person and the two, two families, I think it was two tribes could have been a family. Um, they decided, um, that they were going to resolve it themselves. So they decided that, you know, okay, the person who killed our son will then, um, be responsible for, um, you know, what our son was responsible for. So that could, uh, that could be, um, get gathering food and providing for those type of things. And, 
the U.S. said, no, that's not acceptable. That's, you know, there was a major crime that happened. Someone died and some somebody needs to pay for that. Um, and didn't like the way that the tribe um, handled that, um, which was, you know, when we think about um indigenous sovereignty it's the ability to govern um yourself and that part of that means governing the way um you handle um crime and so this led to the major crimes act where um there are major crimes such as uh i think it's burglary um arson uh and sexual assault falls under the major crimes act so all of these major crimes now um the tribe, the, the indigenous nation does not have authority to, um, to, um, uh, basically, um, say what happens to the perpetrator. Um, and that that automatically goes into the federal responsibility. And this, this will, we'll talk more about this in a little bit. Um, but this impacted tribal sovereignty in that, you know, if, um, someone, um, who was not native, um, sexually assaulted a native person, then the tribe did not have the authority to, um, to, uh, prosecute, um, the non-native, um, perpetrator. And that would go to the federal, um, to the FBI, that then they would be the ones to determine, uh, and then the attorney generals and things like that. So then we have the boarding school era, which was over a century long um, and was had a devastating impact um, on our tribal communities. Um, I think um, Canada for, you know, what I think it was last summer um, had uncovered, I mean, hundreds of um, burials of children who have died I'm in the boarding school area and boarding school era. Um, so the boarding school era kind of served a purpose of, you know, removing children from their home, from their families, communities, um, and forced into boarding schools. And these boarding schools, we see um, the many pictures of cutting of their hair, um, not being able to speak their language, um, oftentimes they would um, separate people from tribes. So they would not put children in the same tribe with each other. They would separate so that there was no um, support systems in that in that way. Um, we see sexual assault um, in very egregious um, just crimes that happened in the boarding school area era that, you know, over a century long. And so we still have people who are my age, thirties, um, who have grandparents and even parents who have been impacted by the boarding school era. Um, and, and so this is important to kind of, um, to know how long that happened. And the purpose was to really, um, assimilate, um, and force um, Native people to assimilate to the settler um, culture and to really try to dismantle um, tribal sovereignty. And, you know, if you remove all the Native people from those, you know, the reservations and those things, then, then there would be no reservation. And then the U.S. would have no obligation to the treaties, no obligation to the tribes, and there would be no essentially no um, sovereign tribes. And so that's kind of what that intent was for the boarding school eras. Then we had the Indian Removal Act. So um, with this, we see the Trail of Tears. Um, we see the Long Walk where um, Native people were removed from their um, Native lands and forced to um, forced to go to reservations and things like that. We have, um, you know, people uh, in Oklahoma that their um, traditional, their native lands aren't even close to Oklahoma. Um, and that was part of that removal act of removing 
um, people from their native homes. Um, and again, this is that settler colonialism with the intent of removing native people so that they, you know, settlers could um, pretty much take over the land. Um, the Sand Creek Massacre happened, you know, in Colorado, where um, along with this removal act, there was um, a group, and I, I refuse, it's, so a group of people, so the U.S. Army would recruit people um, to kind of um, regulate and um, participate in um, regulating Native people. So um, we have the Cheyenne and Arapaho people in the Sand Creek area in Colorado who were forced there um, and staying and just out of nowhere, um, just attacked. Um, even, you know, the chief who was there, who was the leader, had a white flag um, and pretty, pretty much it was just the policy was extermination. And so we see that. And then we see the wounded knee massacre, the same, you know, um, mostly women and children, um, who were forced, um, to remove from their homelands and then kind of stayed in this area that they were only allowed to stay and then were massacred. So we see that in the 1800s. And then we see in the 1900s, the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. So Native people weren't even um, considered citizens in the United States until 1924. Um, the Native American right to vote was achieved in 1964. Um, policies of termination, um, forced sterilization, we see in the 60s. Um, we also, so at the same time, there was forced sterilization, and then we call it the 60s scoop. So um, Native women were um, ster forcibly sterilized um, through, um, through the um, IHS, so it's the Indian Health Services facilities. Um, things like that. And without their knowledge, they had no idea. They did not consent to it. It was just standard practice um, to sterilize Native women. And part of that, at the same time, the 60s scoop, this is referred to where we see a large number of Native children um, being removed from their homes. So um, Native people being seen as unfit parents. Um, a lot of the time it was because of poverty, um, it was really a way to kind of, it's a really a lot of these things were, um, tactics to, um, dismantle and, um, just dismantle native, um, nations, tribes, community. And then we see the Indian Religious Freedom Act of 1978. So native people weren't, um, even allowed to practice our religious freedoms until 1978. Um, not to say that um, they didn't, a lot of the time it would have to go underground. And that's exactly why we see, you know, not why we see what happened at Wounded Knee, but part of it was, um, first, the lack of understanding Native, um, you know, customs and Native beliefs, but also not being allowed to practice um, beliefs, um, not able to smudge not able to have your ceremonies. And a lot of the time, um, it would just have to happen um, underground. Um, and so a lot of the time, a lot of nations um, have, you know, that knowledge because people um, still practice and um, did it underground. And then we have some tribes who completely lost a lot of that um, knowledge a lot of those customs and beliefs because um, of these policies um, and because of these things impacts. Um, and then so we're kind of moving to resiliency. So part of this is developing tribal codes. So um, tribes are now developing their own tribal codes. So along with, um, you know, federal right, victim rights, tribal codes could be, here are what, you know, 
our victim rights are. Um, here's, you know, how we define sexual assault. Here's how we define domestic violence, really, you know, um, asserting sovereignty over these things. Um, we also see building our programs and services. We see a lot of native programs, native shelters opening, um, and then just reclaiming a lot of our culture and our practices and our beliefs. Um, so we're really into this, you know, all of this historical context and resiliency. And I don't want to say there, there wasn't resiliency, you know, in the time frame before, because absolutely there were, there's, that there's a reason we are all still here is that resiliency. Um, and so, of course, I think there are still policies and practices in place and not even policies and practices, but with these policies and practices, they have shaped a lot of behavior. They have shaped a lot of the way that we all interact with one another um, and, and how we interact with um, Native victims and survivors of violence. So all of these things are important to know just because, you know, it's important to know how we got to where we are today. Um, and it's going to be important for that victim and survivor, that Native victim and survivor who comes into your programs and they come in and, you know, are talking about this violence. And then for you to have this context of all these other things that have happened, um, it's going to be really important for you to have that context. Um, and then here, just at the top, I, I love this quote. You must be able to see where you have been before you can possibly know where you want to go. Um, and this is a Mus Muskogee Creek um, quote um, saying, and I think it's very true that, you know, we have to see where we have been, all of us in, you know, that are sharing this um, world with one another, um, know where we were um, to know where we're going or where we want to go. Um, and so um, it's just really important to know. And with that, are there any questions? Next slide, please. Um, so I'll leave for any questions. I know it's like a lot to take in. Um, in an hour and a half, <laughs> um, there are a lot of things in history and that could take a whole, um, I mean, there's a lot of people who get degrees on these things. Um, so it was very fast talking about it, but um, please, if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask them. Um, I do believe you can, uh, we will be sending out um, this PowerPoint. Um, so if you want to look at that um, and have that for, you know, reference, you absolutely can. Um, so again, how does this, you know, relate to multi-generational trauma is that, you know, the relocation survivors of violence, um, witnessing traumatic events, um, experiencing trauma, having, you know, these at terrorist attacks, um, and cultural identity and captivity, all of these things are embedded within one another. So when we are working with native victims and survivors of violence, we're also going to have to unpack a lot of those things, unpack a lot of that trauma from, you know, a longstanding history of violence. And so that's where it's really important to kind of understand these two. Uh, next slide, please. So with that, um, one of the things that leads my work and philosophy and something that is grounding in the work that I do is that Native women have sovereignty. Just as every tribe, every Native woman has sovereignty over themselves and their body. Um, this is a very, so when we think about pre-colonization, Native women had um, sovereignty over their body. And, you know, we see a lot. So looking at the journals of the Spanish um, colonizers, who came and wrote about Native women as being promiscuous, being very open with their sexuality, um, they didn't understand what that meant. So they, and not that they didn't understand what they meant, um, they viewed it differently. So for Native people, having that sovereignty to decide what to do with your own body was respected and um, 
you had that ownership of that. Um, and so when we think about the times of Spain, um, you know, it was very much um, arranged marriage. Um, women had to be virgins um, when they were married. Um, you know, very, very limited with the, the um, just autonomy over their own body. And so when they, you know, Spanish conquistadors, um, colonizers saw that they, they kind of interpreted that as they were free to do whatever they wanted to native women. And that's where we see sexual violence. We see a high rate of sexual violence, a high rate of um, just the entitlement over um, native women um, and their bodies. Um, and so really going back to that pre-colonization idea that native women have sovereignty, they have their own unique path in life that, ha you know, um, has to be without fear and led with freedom, self-governance, they can make their own decisions. Um, they have the resources they need to walk their own path and they speak freely for themselves and to find their own reality. So when we're working with native victims and survivors, we want to, um, come from a place of that. And we also want to reiterate that so that they know that they have sovereignty, that they know that they have, um, the right to live without fear, that they can make their own decisions, that they deserve and are worthy and entitled to resources that they need to walk um, their path. And then they can speak, speak freely for themselves and that they know what's best for them. And that we're simply here to offer some of those resources and um, and just be there with them to connect with them and walk with them, but that they have sovereignty over themselves. Um, and so when we're working with Native victims and survivors, this is a big key um, piece. And I just think any person that we work with, um, but in specific um, contacts with Native people and sovereignty. Um, this is incredibly important to acknowledge. Um, next slide, please. So there are unique legal issues for urban native victims. So native citizens residing in urban areas. So when we talk about the native citizens, it's those who are enrolled in their tribe. So they are enrolled citizens in their, their nation, tribal nation. Um, and if they're residing in urban areas, they face unique issues that are not experienced by any other population in the United States. Um, next slide, please. So we have the VAWA Title IX and Safety for Indian Women. So Section 905 of VAWA um, is tribal protection orders. So this clarifies full civil jurisdiction of tribal courts to issue and enforce CPOs over all persons. And this is... Um, protection orders. Um, and so what we were seeing a lot was um, if someone left their reservation or left their native tribal lands um, and it was their tribal nation that um, issued the protection order, um, it was not being, um, it did not have full faith and credit. So it was not um, other jurisdictions, so non-native jurisdictions um, were not um, seeing it as a legit protection order. So this VAWA protection order states that um, tribal courts do have jurisdiction, full jurisdiction to, to issue CPOs um, and, and that they have the authority to do that. Section 906 is amendments to a federal assault statute. So it amends penalty provision for repeat offenders convicted of interstate VAWA crimes by expanding, expanding definition of prior domestic violence or stalking offenses to include tribal convictions. So um, before tribal convictions were not um, being recorded as um, or uh, not even just um, being seen as a prior domestic violence or stalking offense. And so the 90, section 906 work to fix that, um, to say that, you know, tribal convictions also, um, also show that there's prior domestic violence and stalking offenses. Uh, next, next slide, please. 
And then section 904, tribal jurisdiction over crimes of domestic violence. So the most pivotal section of Title IX safety for Indian women is section 904. And this gives tribal jurisdiction over crimes of domestic violence. So now we are seeing, um, when I first got into this work, it was 2015. And this is where um, there were pilot um location pilot sites. So um, some tribes who were working towards um, being able to um, have jurisdiction and prosecute um, crimes of domestic violence um, within their jurisdiction. And this is huge. This gives um, that sovereignty and it also, you know, holds perpetrators accountable of, um, of going, you know, of committing crimes of domestic violence on native land. Um, and so this was this is pivotal and an important piece to understand. And then section 904 identifies the inherent rights of tribal governments to protect their women. And so <clears throat> what we talked about, we talked about the Major Crimes Act. And so sexual violence, um, tribe, tribal governments do not have the authority to um to um, have jurisdiction over those crimes. And so what this does is it perpetuates violence, sexual violence. It brings people not, and we know that non-native um, perpetrators um, are in higher numbers going um, perpetrating against native um, women, that they are going purposely on tribal lands and committing these crimes, knowing that there will be no accountability because the tribe does not have jurisdiction over those crimes. And, um, you know, it goes to the FBI and just as recent, um, a lot of the times, I want to say over 80% of the time they would throw out the cases. Um, so there was just no accountability. And so this helps um, really give the ability um, of tribal governments to hold um, perpetrators and offenders accountable. Uh, next slide, please. Um, public Law 280. So this one gets tricky. So um, there were, I can't remember the time, what year it was, but um, basically the federal government um, said um, states could opt um, in for, could, um, say, you know, take um, jurisdiction if they wanted to over um, tribal affairs. So California, Oregon, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Nebraska, Alaska, and there's some other um, states that are public law 280 states, where instead of it going directly to the federal government's jurisdiction, it goes to the state. So um, if there is a crime, um, sexual assault, um, in California, it goes to state's jurisdiction. Um, and so this is like where it gets very complicated. So you'll have to under, you'll have to know who's a public law 280 state. Um, and you're gonna wanna know what that means, um, what that looks like. Uh, Minnesota and Oregon and Alaska, there are some tribal nations that um, <clears throat> are not um, included in that public law 280. So for Minnesota, you have Fond du Lac, um, Leech Lake, um, White Earth, you have those tribal nations who do fall, fall under Public Law 280, where jurisdiction would go directly to Minnesota. Red Lake does not follow that, or Red Lake Nation does not. Um, it would go fe to federal. So it's just important to know those things, um, to know those jurisdiction issues um, that happen. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, what is the Indian Child Welfare Act? So um, this is another one that is um, impacts victims and survivors tremendously. Uh, Congress recognized that it is in the best interest of the child to maintain tribal connections and that children are vital to tribes' continued existence and enacted ICWA, so the Indian Child Welfare Act, to protect the best interest of Indian children and to promote the stability and security of Indian tribes and families. Um, so this came about, so we talked about, I talked about the 60s scoop where children were um, often uh, removed from their homes and placed in non-native homes. Um, and this 
was, you know, for many reasons, but what we had, what we have known and what, um, this, um, act, um, you know, was a response to that, um, reality that children, non or children, native children were, um, at a high rate placed into non-native homes. Um, and part of this was that assimilation um, to dismantle um, native um, community, native connections. Um, and so this was a response to that. And so what this means is if there are native children who have to re be removed from the home, they have to be placed into native foster care, um, foster care, or they, you know, their tribe has to be um, informed right away. So let's say you're working with someone, a victim or survivor from, um, let's just say Leech Lake, and they're living in Minneapolis, um, and their children um, were removed, you would then, you know, child would, um, Welfare would then be responsible um, and would have to um, reach out to um, Leech Lake and let them know. And then they would have to work together to find a native home um, foster care for them to be placed. Um, and so that's that's important um, to know. A lot of states are not in compliance with this right now. Um, and they're not following it. And we also saw this year where the Supreme Court was, um, you know, deciding if um, this need to be overturned. And thankfully, it was not. Um, again, this is supporting tribal sovereignty. Um, but this is important for you to know, to understand and um, to advocate for if you have victims or survivors um, whose um, children have been removed to know that um, they have the right um, to, to be placed in native homes. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. So again, what does ICWA do? It governs state child custody proceedings in multiple ways by recognizing tribal jurisdiction over decisions for their Indian children, establishing min minimum federal standards for the removal of Indian children from their families, establishing preferences for placement of Indian children with extended family or other tribal families, and by instituting protections to ensure that birth parents' voluntary relinquishments of their children are truly voluntary. Um, and this is important. As we saw with the 60s scoop, it was not voluntary. They were forced, um, removed um, by, I mean, arbitrary things. We're talking poverty um, and things like that, that were um, being used, even just um, if we look at families, structure. So um, traditionally, um, for some tribes, it was custom for um, all children and mom and dad to share a room um, at night. And, um, you know, child welfare said that is not okay and removing children, you know. So just those little things that were happening um, that led to that 60s scoop. And so this kind of, um, this act really was a response to that um, and ensuring that it doesn't happen again or that we're not, um, that there are practice in, practices in place that um, really work to min, um, diminish this. We see though that um, it is not often being followed. Um, and, and then there are some tribes who don't have the infrastructure to really handle some of these things. So um, that's where it's important to um, to be aware and um, and to really advocate for um, you know native victims and survivors and their families. Uh, next slide, please. So I know it says we're going to take a 15 minute break, but I only have 15 minutes and I wanted to kind of get through this. Um, I guess what I can do is um, speed through the next kind of piece. And then um, if there's any questions um, and we'll just end at 2.30 or 3.30 mountain time. Um, perfect. Thank you.
Um, so what is culture, the values, norms, and traditions that affect how individuals of a particular group perceive, think, interact, behave, and make judgments about their world? So it's how we see the world, the way we see the world, how we perceive the world, how we interact with one another, um, how we behave, um, how we kind of regulate our behavior, um, what's acceptable. Um, you know, one thing I think about is um, in my family, it is incredibly rude to look at people in the eye, especially if they're older than you. And so I never, I always had a really hard time looking my teachers in the eye. And I, I know um, in Western culture, that's seen as maybe deceiving or um, rude or those type of things. But for me, it, it, in my family and culture, it was being respectful. So um, when we think about culture, that's what we're talking about. The norms, the values, traditions that affect how we act, basically, how we perceive other people, how we perceive ourselves in the world, um, and then just make judgments about our world. Next slide, please. It's important because it explains the way we interact with the world around us. So again, you know, having, um, knowing what culture is and knowing, having the, um, the knowledge of why, you know, I'm not looking at an elder in the eyes, um, knowing that explains why, um, and, and really, you know, um, is important just to know that I'm not being deceitful, but it's really just how I was raised and grow, grew up. Um, it provides people with a host of resources that provide strength and can assist in he healing. So again, culture is important because that's where we find community. That's where we find connection and that's where our resources are. So we know for our native um, people that traditional healing and traditional healing is ceremonies, traditional medicines, um, even just connecting to nature in a more indigenous way. Those things are incredibly healing for native victims and um, survivors, more so than any contemporary or mainstream um, healing methods. So um, that's why culture is important. Um, it connects a person to the community and a support system. And so when we're working with victims and survivors, we want to make sure that we are, um, how are we um, centering culture and how are we creating opportunities for native victims and survivors to connect to their culture? Um, this is especially important in urban areas where maybe we have um, a victim or native um, survivor who um, has just moved to the urban area from their home um, from their reservation, and they don't really have connections to the urban native population or community. So, you know, how do you support that? How do you, um, you know, how, how do you get that information out to them? And part of that is just going out there, doing the work, making connections with the urban native community, um, so that you have those things to offer um, when they come in and, and need that support. It's incredibly important. Uh, next slide, please. So the dominant culture perspectives, I don't want to say dom, I'm going to say subtler culture perspectives, because that's kind of what we're talking about right now versus native principles of relationship. So when we think about Western culture, um, and Western culture, I mean, um, you know, um, non-Indigenous to um, the Americas and uh, more of the Eurocentric um, culture. It's very Eurocentric, patriarchal. Um, customs and ceremonies were outlawed. Um, if it was not, you know, um, something, if it was not the main stream um, customs, um, divided tribal lands through um, you know, many, many ways that they've done that through allotment, um, through relocation, all of those things. Um, the boarding school era and the stripped, stripping of names, clothing, family, kinship, traditions, and practice. Um, and then, of course, language 
and other characteristics of culture. So kind of removing anything that um, supported um, native culture in, in thriving that was impacted. And then you have native women where, you know, not all tribes, not all um, tribal nations were matriarchal, um, but many were to where, you know, um, a lot of the proper, the land, and I don't want to say land belonged, but um, if um, a husband or if, you know, um, a person, a married couple um, decided to get divorced, it was the man who moved away because the, you know, the home, the teepee belonged to her um, and her family. Um had a lot of say in what happened in their community. Um, there were coming of age um, ceremonies. So female and tribal women's societies, um, a lot of ceremonies, the coming of age ceremonies, those type of things, they were outlawed. Um, and so they didn't really have a lot of those customs um, were, are lost or um, kind of being revitalized. And then um, divided tribal lands, uh, you know, there's a loss of kinship ties. So I talked about how in the boarding school area or era, era, um, they uh, would purposely um, just, you know, um, they'd have children from different tribes go with one another because they didn't speak the same language. They didn't necessarily have the same connection to one another. Um, and they did that because of, you know, um, impacting some of those kinship. And then there's the servitude versus leadership. So also what happened in the boarding school era was um, really uh, that exploitation of um, indigenous um, people, where it became more servitude. So um, the boarding school, they kind of said, oh, to in order to, um, you know, get them um, assimilated, um, they're going to have to learn how to serve us, you know, learn how to do housework, learn how to do all these things that was more of servitude. So um, vacations or holidays or time away from the boarding school was not really board time away where they could not go back to their families. They would go to a non-Native family and they would basically be their servants. Um, and, and that was, you know, um, what they had to do, um, versus leadership, not having any, any autonomy or any capability of, of leadership within themselves. Um, and then this was a destruction of cultural identity and loss of tribal values. So, you know, with those tribal values, with this loss of cultural identity, family, um, structure was impacted the way we see, um, education, um, that's impacted relatives, how we interconnect with one, how we connect with one another, um, how we view one another, um, you know, where we see pre-colonization, it's a very, um, connected, um, more so lanes towards, uh, a connecting community rather than individualistic. We see, you know, through boarding school era and through all these things, it really impacted some of those values, such as the interconnectedness, um, relative um, values and spirituality. And so we see a lot of these things and how they impacted um, Native women and not just women, but Native people. Uh, next slide, please. So how is culture viewed? So after learning about history and policies that affect Native people, how do these systems view Native survivors of domestic violence? Um, so thinking about institutions, law enforcement, hospitals, courts, social services. So looking at those, the history and the policies while we are moving towards um, dismantling some of those things, these policies, these belief systems have heavy, um, have just, they just have heavy, um, they still impact our beliefs today. So uh, I remember not long ago, um, Vicki, our executive director was telling me of an experience she had living in Duluth where 
um, law enforcement, and I mean, this was in the 80s, um, would instead of putting native, um, you know, if they were arresting someone and that person was native, instead of putting them in the back of the car, they would put them in the trunk. Um, you see this with hospitals where even today, I don't know how many trainings I'm in where um, native um, advocates say, you know, I brought a victim or survivor to this hospital and they said, you need to go to the Indian Health Services, which was, you know, an hour away. Um, you know, so that's just, you know, these behaviors and these belief systems that impact the wellness of victims and survivors and their ability to seek those resources that we talked about um, at the beginning, um, where, you know, it's one thing to not have a sexual assault, uh, a forensic exam nurse. Um, it's even more so when you're, you know, coming from, um, you know, and tribal land and then being told you can't go, you need to go somewhere else. Um, even, you know, with native victims and survivors who are in urban areas that sure. You, so an example would be Colorado Springs and our closest, um, IHS was in Denver. And so, you know, having this perspective of, oh, you need to go to the IHS and not go to the local Colorado Springs hospital that creates such barriers. It creates transportation issues, um, standard of care, those type of things. So these are ways in which um, they, um, we see these policies and history affect um, law enforcement, hospitals, courts, social services, those type of things. Then it, it impacts community at large, you know, through our city or county or neighborhood um, where we just, we see um, forced, you know, segregation, um, where we see a lot of, um, where uh, we see heavy pollution, which neighborhoods are most impacted by that. It's largely um, oppressed um, communities who, you know, don't have access to um, healthy food, don't have access to clean air, those type of things, how we structure our community, how we build our city, how we tell, you know, um, how we decide where we want to live. Um, and then our circle, our family, our friends, ourselves, we, it, you know, how it impacts us. Um, internalized oppression is a big thing where, you know, after being, um, you know, listening to history and um, seeing it firsthand uh, that you are nothing but a savage, how does that start internalizing yourself? How do you start seeing that um, and internalizing that? And then lateral oppression, how do we start, um, you know, um, struggling with one another. Um, and so these are things, you know, the breakdown of how these policies and history impacted us um, as Native people. Uh, next slide, please. So cultural humility versus cultural competence. So again, this is just going back to what we talked about before. You can never be competent in a culture outside of your own. Um, it's a lifelong process of learning. There's a lot of self-reflection. You incorporate learning, understanding power imbalances. This is a big one where I think, I think this is a critical one, knowing um, some of those power imbalances of, um, you know, which cultures are deemed more powerful, are deemed more important um, than, than others. And then does not ex assume an expertise, but is a willing student. So you um, know that you're not an expert in this, but you are a willing student. I also, um, you know, just because I um, have Indigenous roots does not mean that I know everything about every Indigenous person, um, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. Um, and so we just want to make sure that we know that, that we are not experts in things, but um, we're always willing to learn. Um, and then just training to be culturally competent. So we're trained, we are working towards being able to um, recognize different cultures other than our own, being able to, you know, put ourselves in their shoes of where they're coming from, understand their perspective, understand where their values are, um, and to understand that so that we can um, better um, respond to them. Uh, next slide, please. 
So just intervention considerations underserved that consider that native victims and survivors are underserved population. So, you know, most likely you don't get a lot of native victims or survivors walking into your door um, due to a lot of barriers, due to a lot of things. So when you do have one, a victim or survivor who's native come in, it's really that important critical piece to making sure that you respond in a good way um, and, and to keep all things in consideration, consider multi-generational trauma, um, victim advocate notification, understand unique legal issues, victim safety. So knowing what, what, what are in place for native victims in particular. So that would be, you know, the protection orders. If they have a protection order that came from their um, tribe, it is valid anywhere and that it needs to be treated as um, any other protection order those type of things, victim safety, equa, knowing that. And then you want to have, know the cultural support. So what are the healing ceremonies in your community? What are some traditional medicines in your community? Um, spirituality. What are the roles within family and the community? Language, um, kinship system. So knowing all these things. So if you don't know that, you know, um, take on that responsibility and take on that um, to where you search for that in your community, um, especially in your in a big urban area where relocation, um, Denver was a big relocation um, area, um, city, Chicago, where there's probably um, a great um, native community where you can um, just learn from and, and do it in a way that you're not you know, hey, tell me all the things, but, you know, if they have events for the community to learn, go. Um, if, you know, there's a person that you can connect with, um, connect with them so that you know what those cultural supports are so that you can give victims and survivors um, these supports. Uh, next slide, please. So as we heal ourselves, we heal our ancestors and transform the future of our nations. This is from Dr. Corinne Sanchez. So through that is our healing ceremonies, language, our interconnection and responsibility to one another and within our family and our community, um, our spirituality and our traditional medicines, to just name a few. Um, next slide. Oh, goals for working with Native women, create a sister space. So you're building a trusting relationship by acknowledging their cultural identity. A sister space is just, we're all relatives. So if we treat each other as that, um, that is a great um, place to start. Create a system of support, gain knowledge about historical roots of violence, become aware of your organization's accessibility to Native people, and develop a working knowledge of jurisdictional complexities. So if there's some trainings that are available that talk about tribal jurisdiction issues or complexities, definitely sign up for those. Um, and next slide, please. Um, being an ally, use your advocacy skills and listen, ask questions to get information, but it's not time for you to get educated about their culture. So if you have questions that are important and pertinent to um, victim safe, safety or just the services, then absolutely. But um, definitely don't um, use that time to um, ask them all the things. Um, and then communication style may vary from yours for a number of reasons. So, you know, I talked about um, um, eye contact, direct eye contact. Maybe they're not comfortable with that, um, you know, and just understanding um, the way maybe we, you know, I think, um, the, just how we kind of communicate our experiences might not be, um, exactly how you communicate that. A great example I have, um, this is not in relation to my work as an advocate, but, um, my husband is white and the way he interacts with his family is very different from how I interact with my family, where if we say we're going to get off the phone, it usually takes us an hour because, you know, to get off the phone, but for my husband, like through mid sentence, if he has to go, he'll just say, Oh, I have to go. And they go, okay, bye. And like, hang up like that just would not happen for, for 
uh, my family, it would be very rude. Um, but I understand like, it's not rude in their family. So understanding that it varies for a number of reasons. Um, next slide, please. So then just knowing how's your program, you want to ask yourself these questions of how are we accessible? Um, does our staff currently have knowledge of the native specific programs in surrounding communities? And how is your program being an ally beyond its program doors? Um, so you want to ask yourself those questions and really be honest and do some introspective work. Um, and again, I think one of your, the best way to know is to get out in those um, native specific programs and um, and just be willing to um, for feedback and be willing to make changes as need be. Uh, next slide, please. So now I'm leaving it for questions. I know we are over 10 minutes. I'm so sorry. Um, but please, if you have any questions, feel free to type them. If not, um, you have our, e our email or our website. You have my email. Um, you can feel free to email me. Um, here are some national tribal resources. We have some resources if you need. Um, if you have any thoughts that come up or if you would like um, any technical assistance, um, we are here to offer any help and any support we can. Um, so the Strong Hearts Native Helpline is a great one, especially if you want to find out if there's any Native specific um, organizations in your area. Um, the National Indian Country Clearinghouse on Sexual Assault, um, National Indigenous Women's Resource Center has great webinars um, th that are recorded and you can watch. The National Tribal Justice Resource Center, um, all of the things um, these are all great resources to start with. Um, is there another slide with some more resources? I thought maybe there would be. Oh, and this is just talking about our training and technical assistance. So we can do one-to-one -one consultations. We can look over your policies and documents. Um, a big one that I see a lot is, especially in transitional housing, is if you have participants who um, no longer um, are eligible and they talk, we call, um, it would be termination. And with that historical context of the um, termination area era, um, we, you know, would ask to um, maybe instead of using termination, use something else. Um, so we can help with those things, work sessions, so we can do on-site or virtual, um, customize to dig deeper on issues that you're seeing in your community or within your program, um, webinars, conferences, workshops, all of those things. So please feel free to reach out um, and thank you for joining me and thanks for, for hanging on. Um, and I, I look forward to hearing from you all. Thank you, Raquel. Before we end the session, I want to let you all know that there will be an eval popping up as once the Zoom closes. We'd love to hear what you thought. So if you're able to fill that out, we'd very much appreciate it. As a reminder, this webinar was recorded and will be uploaded onto Redwind's YouTube channel within the next few days. You can also find previous recordings there. In closing, I'd like to thank Raquel. I'd like to thank our captioner. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. I hope you have a safe, wonderful rest of your day, and I hope to see you all in the next webinar.